Hi, this is, I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to the first episode of Vice Versa, where Ricky and I will be talking about things from the BMW announcing their iX, the Ford Transit van that they just announced, Tesla tequila, and more. So good to talk to you, Ricky. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. We decided to make this channel because our channels are both pretty similar, and the videos that we make take hours of research and writing and editing. So we sometimes don't have a chance to cover the things in the news that maybe is of interest. So we decided on this channel, we'll have a chance to just talk about what's going on in the week um, in the world of EVs and, and energy and technology. So you want to start it off with that and talk sure. about our first topic? Sure. So the first topic that we're going to be talking about is the uh, BMW announcing their, uh, <laughs> I guess you'd call it a what is it, SUV? It's the BMW iX that they just uh, announced. And this thing is, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> it's got a range that they're estimating around 300 miles. They haven't announced the price, but it's expected to be probably around $70,000 is where people are expecting it to be. Um, as you can see from these images, uh, I've got some pretty strong feelings about the design. I'm curious to hear what you think. Uh, <laughs> my my initial impressions of the exterior are not good. I don't know if you can. This is this is another one of those designs okay where it's from a, some angles like that. The back and the the back three quarters I think is is pretty good looking. I don't know, just some of this just strikes me again as you know it's it comes back to the. <sighs> When you're designing an EV, it has to be a futuristic car. So they're designing it so that it looks futuristic. When you don't need to do that, just focus on making a great looking car that people want to buy. And the design of it, I think, is just a little too, like there's blue seat belts they have in it. There was the crazy, like they're stick, sticking with that front grille that you don't need on an EV. It's like, I don't know why they've got that on there. It just looks like it's slapped on. I don't know what the point of it is. It's just, there's... So much about it, I don't understand. And then on top of that, the 300 mile range, uh, I was seeing that some people were digging into the numbers. And if you look at the efficiency, it's about 30% less efficient than a Model Y to achieve that same range. And it's like, the argument of efficiency is an interesting one. Cause like not all cars today, you know, you have a 30 mile an hour, 30 miles per gallon car or a 20 miles per gallon car. So it's like, it's all over the map. So it doesn't really affect the performance of the car, but it affects what you're going to be paying over time because it's going to take more energy to charge it up. And then from the company's point of view, you have to pack a huge battery in there, which can cost them more money, which eats into their profit margins. And it makes you wonder, like, how are they going to be able to <laughs> keep it, make a actually competitive, a price competitive car if they're packing such a massive battery pack in there? It's just, I, I just, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm happy to see them making an EV, and I want to see more EVs on the road, but this just has me concerned. <laughs> yeah, and they've, they've come out and said 300 miles, so that's not really negotiable at this point, so they have to hit that number. Um, yeah. I actually, I'm happy with this car because, yeah, the front grille is kind of, kind of crazy. I think all these companies are making that front grille bigger and bigger, and companies like Audi, it, it lends well to that because their hexagon or pentagon grille kind of lends itself to being stretched out. But BMW's yeah. kidney grill, I don't know that it translate very, translates very well. <laughs> but the it thing doesn't. is, at least they're trying here. Because if you look at their BMW M4, it has the same look. So to me, I never liked the BMW i3. I, people who own the car have really enjoyed it. But BMW went way out of their way to make it look ridiculous and different than anything else that they've ever made. So here, though, I think the iX looks like the future design language. So... I guess in a way, good job, BMW. You're showing that you're you're serious about this, and you're making it look like a flagship car as opposed to whatever the i3 was, or the yeah, yeah you know. So yeah. that's probably a good thing. But um, yeah, that huge elongated kidney grill. I just uh, I don't know if it it translates very well. Um, I guess time yeah. will tell, and that is kind of that is a subjective measure. So maybe people have different opinions, but they're making it. I hope uh, the price is probably going to be yeah seventy. Like the I pace is in that range. Most of these cars are kind of in that range. So I think seventy would. I mean, is seventy thousand a deal breaker? People would people still buy it? It's kind of in the same I, class as the Model Y, possibly. Yeah, I think for a typical like BMW fan, a BMW buyer, it's. I don't think they're going to bat an eye at that price. I think it's probably f the pricing is just fine. But 
I just I just get concerned when I see oh it's thirty percent less efficient. It's like okay, it's gonna be thirty percent more money to charge that thing up every single time you charge it up. It's like ugh, come on, you can do better than that. <laughs> but I mean, maybe they got to start somewhere, and yeah, if they do make this in any kind of volume and that they learn from it, and their next car is closer and kind of you know makes up that ground, then they'll be in good shape. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah, and I think what people don't realize is. Like uh, Tesla's been making cars for like 10 years, so, and they've been making electric cars for 10 years. And so even though BMW has been making cars, gasoline cars, for a long time, building electric cars has its own set of challenges. I'm always hearing about new EVs that are going under recalls, right? Because it's, it's a tough thing to do. There's a lot of new tech that goes into it. So they got to get started somewhere. And if this is the car to start with, I think it'll appeal to the American or the North American buyer. And yeah. uh, hopefully they sell enough of them to to warrant like investment in battery and supply chain stuff. Yeah, that, that's my big concern. Is like I just want to see whenever whenever any company like this releases an EV, I just want to see them succeed. It's like I'm not coming at this from like a Tesla fan. I'm coming at it from an EV fan. I want to see all these companies succeed because if they sell a lot of these, they'll keep making more. It's kind of like the the Porsche Taycan. It's people laughed about its lack of efficiency, but it's it's Porsche's best seller in the United States. It's like it's selling more than any other Porsche that's on the market in the U.S. So it's like they're going to be doubling down on making more of these because it's their best-selling car. So it's like I want to see BMW have that same success, but with this, I'm I'm dubious. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but I have concerns. Yeah, good point, good point. And I'm hoping they ha- they had the same exact reaction as Porsche, where their mm. other crossover SUV sales plummet, and this kind of takes off. But I, I don't know that they'll have volume. The difference with the Taycan is it's a low volume car. All all yeah. Porsches are low volume, but BMW sells a lot of those, you know, X3s and X5s and stuff. So we'll see. Hopefully they can get the battery logistics in hand and build these cars fast enough. Because I know the e-tron and the iPace both had battery problems. Because again, you can't just make the car. You have to really get the battery part figured out. So hopefully yeah. they do that. Yeah. So next all up, right, you want to take. You want to take the next one? You want to talk about the uh, Ford uh, delivery van? Sure. So this one is pretty interesting because I think most of what we've been seeing with EVs has been around, um, you know, personal use cars, sedans, passenger kind of stuff. But there's probably nowhere where the electric vehicle is more disruptive than for commercial use because, like you mentioned, Matt, I think you told me you have about 8,000 miles on your car in two years. I have about 10,000 in a year. Um It'll, it'll be a long time before we even get close to the battery degradation or having to replace any of this stuff. Electric cars last a long time. But for these transit, like the Ford Transit customer, and for anybody who's thinking about buying the e-transit, you might be able to make up your money for this thing really quickly. Because in the time, within a couple of years, you're probably going to rack up half a million miles. And that's where the electric vehicle can really shine. Even if you have to change a battery pack around three or 400,000 miles, the powertrain most likely is going to last well into well above that and not having to do all that maintenance and everything else is going to pay for itself so as 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 glamorous and cool as like the tesla sedans are for like personal use the electric car might actually be the most profitable or the most lucrative for like industrial commercial um, applications yeah no it's when I, whenever I think about the e-transit side of things, it's like Amazon buying in, saying, was it in the next five to 10 years, they're going to have some crazy like 100,000 fans on the road. It's They're going with Rivian, right? Yeah, they're going with Rivian, building it out for them. But it's, it's, it's really cool to see that there's companies starting to try to fill that void because there's far more pollution coming from those style of vehicles than there are from passenger cars. So you have to address it at some point, and it's like with a semi-truck, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't want to bring up Nikola, but I'm going to bring up Nikola. It's like, I, I, it's, I'm sad to see them kind of face plant, but it's like that semi-truck uh, needs to be addressed as well. Um, there's another company called Arrival that is starting to come in delivering vans like this as well. Um, it seems a little more of like a boutique shop um, compared to something like what Ford's going to deliver, but we need to address this, and this is—it's pretty cool to see them coming out and, and finally bringing one to market. Yeah, Arrival is also working on a bus. So talking about public yeah. transit and cleaning up cities, especially where there's a lot of urban density, 
Uh, and I'm actually meeting or I'm talking with them, I'm doing a web call with them on Monday. So I'll maybe do a future video on that. We'll, we'll put a link yeah. whenever that comes up. But I'm, yeah, I'm going to be talking to them point. too. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Yeah. In a couple there's weeks. There's going to be a lot of overlap, Matt. That's why I'm, I'm glad we're doing this. I think there's there's the kinds of stuff that we do are, are similar. And if yeah. we could bring our viewers together and, and talk about some of this stuff, I think. Hopefully yep. they enjoy it. We'll, we'll find out after, after a couple we'll, of these we'll episodes. We'll find out people like this in a little bit. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's move right along. What's what's up next? Uh, how about we talk about... Um, here, let me pull this one up. The Tesla autopilot full self-driving costs of $10,000. So they've... They're hitting ten thousand dollars now for full self driving, which is getting into kind of for me bonkers, crazy pants, oh my god territory. Um, and Elon keeps saying that this is not where it's going to end; it's going to go even higher than this at some point. And that to me <laughs> is just it's 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 kind of crazy. It's getting that expensive. And one of my concerns with how this is getting priced and putting out to market is that. It's, <laughs> you're buying full self-driving for a specific car. So average owner keeps their car for what, five, seven years or something like that before they move on to the next one. Right. So are you going to really plunk down $10,000 for full self-driving for a car that you might only keep for five to seven years? The answer is probably going to be no for most people, um, especially with full self-driving not being a real thing yet. It's... He, he's talked about within the next year it's going to be feature complete, but that doesn't mean that it's bulletproof. It's not usable, but the features will be there. Um, so it's going to be a few years before this thing is probably truly usable. And the fact that they're charging ten thousand dollars for it already is where it's kind of like, why is it not a tied? Why is it not tied to my account, not my car? Because that would make it a huge incentive that once you go into Tesla, you stay in Tesla. Because like, if they end up charging twenty thousand dollars for this thing, I could put twenty thousand dollars down and then change my car every five years, and I always have full self driving because I paid the twenty thousand dollars for the full self driving. And it makes me wonder what their strategy is. It almost makes me think that they're probably going to go to a you know they're probably going to shift to a subscription model at some point because it's going to be so expensive. Nobody's going to want to pay that. But you could charge fifty bucks a month, you know, or thirty dollars a month to get the service. It's I, I just don't, I don't know how you feel about it. But it, it seems strange to me. Yeah, my my opinions are probably stronger than yours because you've already paid for it and you paid for yeah. it during a killer deal. I think you you mentioned that you bought it um, on sale, right? At twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> if I <laughs> if I had that choice right now, I'd I'd get it for twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, the last time I thought about it was around eight thousand, um, and all these, you know, I got all these posts and messages about, oh, they're going to raise the price to ten thousand, get it now. While well, you know, like eight thousand is still a lot of money, and and you're 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 totally right. If I decide, oh, I want to trade this in and get a Model Y because it's better for my family, it wouldn't it wouldn't translate, I don't think. And what's really weird is if you trade it into Tesla, for example, which I'm not saying you could just sell a private party. But is that is it stuck with the car? Does the next owner have full self driving? I think yes, right? Yeah, yeah, okay, it, yeah. It's, it sticks with the car. It doesn't stick with you. But I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if if you were to trade it back to Tesla that they don't honor it, like in the trade in value, because it's just a switch that they flip on and off. So there's yep. all these kinds of like soft good cost or what the real value is kind of kind of considerations, and um, <laughs> I've. I'm always amazed that the people who drive Teslas love Tesla so much that they were they'd be willing to pay this price. And there's people on Twitter who who say, "Oh, ten thousand dollars it sounds like a lot, lot of money, but it's a bargain for what you're getting." I can appreciate that level of like fandom and and um, appreciation, but that's a ton of money, and I I don't have it, and I don't have any plans of getting it at this point because um, because it's a lot of money, I guess. Uh, I, I'm just gonna wait and see because. I would like to get it, and I've seen some of the videos of the, the beta. It does seem really promising, but I think we need some competition. If I've been hearing that Super Cruise from GM, uh, I think it's their Cadillac division, I think has some cars that have some pretty good self-driving tech. But if some other competitors came along that forced Tesla's hand, that's the only way we can get around this, because otherwise Tesla holds all the cards, and they can jack up 
the prices to whatever they want and what can we do about it, right? So yeah, there's also some third-party companies like comma.ai mm -hmm. who build like a third-party like add-on kit to add self-driving. I'm really hopeful that companies like that emerge because otherwise, yeah, we'll be stuck paying into the monopoly pricing that Tesla currently has the uh, luxury of charging us. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I, it's Competition is going to be key here. And the nearest competitor, in my opinion, is Waymo. And they're a radically different architecture and structure. And they're not going after passenger vehicles. They're going after commercial vehicles like taxis and uh, semi-trucks. That's what they're going after. So in the consumer space, Tesla is pretty much the only game in town at the moment. Yeah, I'm not I'm not very keen on Waymo actually. I think their kind of high definition LIDAR 3D mapping approach is too fickle. The world is just way too unpredictable. So my prediction actually, uh, and we'll do a video two years from now, we'll see if I was right. My prediction is companies like NVIDIA, IBM, uh, maybe Sony, who's kind of shown some interest in selling sensors and stuff, will be out doing this. Because what you need really is computer vision. And as good as Tesla is a computer vision, there are companies that just just in terms of computer vision who, who could compete with Tesla on that front, like NVIDIA probably could. So I think what NVIDIA could get into the business of doing is selling the computers and the GPUs, like the hardware you need to do this well, plus some sort of a platform, partner with someone like IBM perhaps, and build out a just a kit. You just stick in your car, it ties into their servers, it upgrades automatically, and companies like Ford or Rivian, anybody could get the self-driving package. Because at this point, Tesla's lead in terms of just raw data, how much that they have, is going to be tough for other people to compete with. And I think that's the differentiator. If you're buying a new car, I want the Tesla because of all the self-driving stuff. So I think there's going to be like a third-party vendor who comes in and just really brings in another level of, of this kind of AI and neural network knowledge. Yeah. And Silicon Valley companies like NVIDIA come to mind. Yeah, I agree with you. There's going to be some third party that comes in with a plug-and-play model that you can put into any car. But my take on Waymo is different. Um, I actually have visited Waymo. I've ridden one of their taxis. I got a chance to talk to some of their engineers. And my takeaway is very different because when I, I asked them point blank, I'm like, what's your take on LiDAR versus computer vision for being able to drop your car anywhere and it will just work? And the engineer said to me, that's our same goal. It's like, we're trying to build a car that eventually you can drop anywhere in the world and it will just work. So they're trying to get to the same exact destination. They're just taking different paths to get there. So after talking to them, I realized it's not as simple as Elon makes it sound of like, if you follow LiDAR, it's a fool's errand. It's like, they're, it, it is a crutch. They're using something to get them somewhere, but the end goal is still the same. So I think Waymo- have goals of eventually including a lot of computer vision? They wouldn't give me details like that. Yeah. But based on what he said to me, I was reading between the lines, and it sounds like it's basically going to be a combination of computer vision and LiDAR in the end so that you can drop the car anywhere and it will just function. But right yeah. now, they need that high-resolution mapping, the LiDAR, and a little bit of computer vision to make it work. So it's like, I think they're going to get to the same place. If they can get there in the same amount of time it's going to take Tesla, I have no idea, but... <laughs> But I wouldn't discount Waymo. I, I think there's, yeah. I think they're 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 on a good path for what they're doing. I think eventually they'll probably start to move closer and closer to computer vision. But that's not my personal take. Yeah, let's hope there's there's a good amount of computer vision because that really is the key. You have to be able yeah. to look ahead and figure out what that sign means. That is a temporary in cement in a bucket, just for now because there's a detour. You have to be able to figure out all that sort of stuff. And um, their system does their system does that. Like you, you you sit in your Model 3 and you're driving around now and you can see like it will show pedestrians walking down the street. It shows you garbage cans and little pylons and you can see the turn, you know, the turn painted things on the ground showing up on the map in your Model 3 now. The right. the Waymo ride did the same exact thing. I was seeing people walk down the street. I could see bikes, I could see everything. So it's like they're using LiDAR combined with cameras. So it's like they're okay. doing the same thing, but they're just what coming at it from the, uh, What about the arrows on the, on, like painted on the floor, on the ground, on the road? It, it's, it's, it saw everything. But okay. they've done high there, resolution there mapping. Then. But they've done high resolution mapping combined with that. So it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it, it seems like they're further along right now than I think Tesla is 
as far as like reliably having a car drive around on its own. But Tesla is it going to leapfrog them very quickly with what they're doing right now because the computer vision is just going to launch them so much faster ahead. That's my personal take. Yeah, and also if if you had a a, a fleet of cars that was developing high definition maps with lidar for San Francisco and Los Angeles and Boston. That's still a huge number of customers. I mean, you can't write that off and say just because it doesn't work everywhere that it doesn't really have value because a huge fleet of you know self-driving robo taxis in SF would be a huge game-changing huge. level of <laughs> yes. revenue. Yeah, so, massive. Yeah, and maybe that's generation one of Waymo is look. We operate in these eight places that we have mapping for, and we upgrade the maps every month to account for very vari- variations and changes. And that's where we are today. And Tesla is more like drop it anywhere and it'll figure it out kind of thing. So yeah. there's probably room for both. And I'm, I'm hoping and I'm optimistic that, that there will be much more competition in this space. We really, really need it. Yeah, $10,000, yeah, that's... <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> it's going to go up. Is, it's yeah. going to go higher. I don't get it. Yeah. So next, and next... As long as people it's... keep paying it, they'll keep doing it, by the way. Yeah. So next up, do you want to talk a little bit... Uh, you want to have a little drinky-winky with a little Tesla tequila? <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to ask you, did you buy it? Did you get into it and buy it? I, did, I, did, I did not. I did not. I was very tempted, though. Um, here, let me just pull up the image of it really quick. Because this bottle, oh, man, the bottle alone is just incredible. Um, here we go. So if you haven't seen this, oh, my gosh. This thing, just the bottle alone, I, I want this. <laughs> <laughs> I want this so much, but it was, I just couldn't justify the $250 that they're charging for it. it that's kind of um, excessive. <laughs> but you have, uh, to, to me, the 250 was kind of crazy. I, so I did buy one. I bought one. I actually kind of wish I had bought more than one at this point because I heard that people are selling them on eBay for stupid amounts and stuff. I, all this it's going to be a collector's item. Bugs me. It will be. And yeah. I was telling my wife, like, you know, you can have the tequila. I just want the bottle. I'll, I'll put, you know, <laughs> sweet tea in it for all for all I care. <laughs> but it is an absolutely beautiful bottle, and um, it just shows you the power of their brand and their marketing machine. They are they are in like the top one percent of companies in terms of just the power of 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 their brand, um, and their their collaboration with companies. I think is something that they can do more of in the future, and they'll have this kind of super exclusive, you know, low volume products every once in a while the other thing was the um the short shorts remember that <laughs> oh yeah those finally came out <laughs> yeah i'm sure you got yourself a pair and uh maybe you can... <laughs> i did not <laughs> and nobody would want to see that <laughs> well, let's, we'll wait for the viewers to decide but yeah this is the kind of fun stuff that they come up with i mean who would have thought tequila i i, I had kind of heard rumors about it but incredible I'll have it on a shelf somewhere uh, as soon as I get it. I think the the time lab- the timetables right now are end of November or December, so we'll see. What's what's brilliant is they don't they don't spend money on advertising. They don't like spend money on advertising, but this is advertising. This yeah. this is advertising and it's I got to tip my hat to Elon and his team cuz they know exactly how to play social media, get coverage, and it's free press. It's like it's it's inc- it's incredible how they are really savvy about how they approach their brand and their public persona to kind of generate their own buzz without having to spend s- s- insane amounts of money for advertising. It's very clever. I, yeah, I actually heard that they fired their marketing teams as well. Did you hear about yeah. this? Yeah, I heard the same thing. So they they had I mean yeah they never they were never really big on spending but whatever little money they did have on marketing personnel uh, for example I had a video on my Tesla Powerwall and my kids were in it and so somebody from Tesla reached out and said oh my gosh your kids are so cute can we use your footage so we had this little photo shoot my wife had them all dressed up and running around and we took video and we we sent it to them for for them to use in their like whatever in the future but I think that person I spoke with that job position doesn't exist anymore from what i gather i think they pretty much did away with it and they rely on their fans and all the hundreds of like youtube channels and twitter accounts that that love tesla and kind of do the promoting for them for free so yeah yeah it, this would probably it's, it's, look into the future of tesla's promotional and marketing um direction make cool one-off products that have very exclusive um yeah. clients and and get people talking about you yeah, I'm really curious how they do handle this because it's like they got rid of the department, 
but it doesn't mean that there aren't people that have a responsibility to handle some of this stuff. So I'm just, I'm, it's the way they approach everything is they, they go to the beat of their own drummer. It's like, I'm really curious who it is over there that's kind of shepherding these kind of projects because there's not a specific marketing department that would do it anymore. Good point. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's the meme lord himself. Maybe he just comes up with cool <laughs> little ideas and then kind of says, figure, find a vendor who could white label it for us and make it happen. And yeah, I, I, was, I was reading that this particular tequila bottle, they had little Easter eggs of it in some of the showrooms. And if, if you looked in at, you know, the, their solar glass roof promotional stuff, if you looked in the window, they had the little bottle and some of the promotional stuff. So they have fun. And I love that about Tesla. They have fun with it. They, they're always kind of, thinking differently about this. And I think they're going to change how, especially startups, view things like marketing, which if you're going to build an electric car, all the money you can, you know, kind of divert for the R&D department, the better you'll be probably. So. Right. Yeah. So next up would be, you want to talk about the, the Rivian yeah, dropping and, the uh, prices? I'll share my screen here. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is an interesting one for me because um, I I kind of want one of these, especially. So here's we'll start with the the truck, I guess. But oh, there we go. There we go. Okay, so the prices are probably cheaper than I thought they would be. So the base model, the the Explorer, will start at sixty seven five. Yeah, and this particular configuration will ship in about a year, um, a year and a half from now, like fourteen, fifteen months from now, and that price point is still more than the Cybertrucks, but the deliveries might potentially be sooner, depending on how the Austin Gigafactory production goes. But what I like about the the Rivian is all the cars, from what I can gather, are quad motor, and they have all the the same sort of basic stuff, the three hundred miles of range and everything else. Really what you're paying for is a little bit of extras and the launch edition gets you the delivery in seven, eight months from now, which is cool. So potentially in June of next year, we'll have people on the road with electric pickup trucks, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Are you a pickup truck guy, Matt? I'm not. I never have been. And I didn't become one until, honestly, the Cybertruck. It's like the Cybertruck like yeah. kind of blew me away. It's like, it's ugly in a I think it's a beautiful ugly and there's just something about it that really just pulled me into it and i've never wanted a truck because they're not fuel efficient they're not um you know what i mean it's like I, i've always looked for efficiency in my cars and so i've never really wanted one but now that there are ev trucks coming out of market it's like suddenly i'm kind of like maybe i do want a truck because there's so many <laughs> times where it's like i've needed to go pick something up from like home depot and it's like i have no space to put it like, right. and so it's like, I have to have it delivered. And it's like, I'd re much rather just be able to go over there, get it myself. And so it's like, the idea of getting an EV truck is appealing. Um, and the fact that Rivian just dropped their prices much closer to a, the price point of a cyber truck, I, I, I find that pretty exciting. And I don't know if you've watched the, there's a TV show on Apple TV plus called the long way up with Ewan McGregor and his friend, Charlie Rude, Charlie, I can't remember his last name, but he, they drive, they're, they rode motorcycles from the tip of South America up to LA and it took them months to do. They drove, it was like 15,000 miles and they drove um, electric uh, bikes from Harley Davidson and the crew drove two Rivians and they were prototype Rivians. Like their VIN numbers were wow. 0001 and 00002 and the Harley Davidsons were the same thing. The two first hand built, you know, EVs Harley Davidson made specifically the for them. Wire. Thing. Yeah. So they were basically driving, driving prototype live wires and then the crew was driving prototype Rivians and Rivian even installed chargers up the coastline of like South America for them to be able to charge up. And the show is is fantastic because like the first like three episodes are all dealing with they were completely unprepared for how to charge these things and they keep running out of juice and like the Rivians can be tow charged. So if you, if you tow them, interesting, just towing them for like 20 minutes will fill their battery up like halfway. So it was wow. like they had to tow charge the Rivians, but my, after watching the whole series, 
I have such respect for Harley Davidson and such respect now for Rivian and that truck. These were prototypes and the stuff that they had to do with these trucks, putting them through their paces, they were amazing. It's like, it's, I just, I'm, I'm blown away. And at the end of the series, uh, what's, what's the CEO of Rivian? I can't remember his name. Do you remember? Uh, he, he was, he was on the final episode of the show and he said to them, were you happy with them? And they were like, they blew us away. He said, well, the new ones that are actually going to be the actual delivered ones have twice as much torque. <laughs> it was like, so they were driving Rivians that aren't even up to spec for what they're going to sell. And it was like wow. just crazy what they were able to do. So it's, it's, I have a lot of respect for Rivian. I'm very excited for them to hit the market. I think whoever's ordering them is going to be extremely happy. It's like, I have high hopes for it. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, see, this is the new age of marketing. What, what you just described is incredibly brilliant, right? If you think about the next thing we're going to talk about, um, old legacy companies still like hire some famous celebrity, have them talk about something they know nothing about. Like it, it's, that's the old way. The new way is make a TV show and show electric motorcycles and electric trucks going up from Patagonia to <laughs> Los Angeles. That's just incredible. That's just such a cool... Um, way to, to, to go about um, showing off some of the new tech. So I'm also a Cybertruck reservation holder. I, f same kind, kind of thing as you. I've never been a truck person. I've, it's never, I've never needed it for work or anything. But I want a Cybertruck, and I'm going to get one. <laughs> but this is the R1S is the electric vehicle that I am the most tempted to buy. I love the look of it. And having yeah. kids and just the need for extra seating the seven-seater options for this car, I think, is very appealing. And starting at seventy thousand, that's pretty much like Range Rover money. Like kind of maybe even like a lower end, kind yep. of basic Range Rover. So financially, I think it's right where it needs to be, price-wise, and I think it's going to be incredible. That front trunk. I remember at a fully charged live, I got to, we got to see one of these in person, and I know you were there too. The yep. trunk on the R1S is enormous. It is pretty much the trunk of the average like car. It is huge. So I yeah. think this will just be an incredible road trip car. Oh, no doubt. This thing is going to be so comfortable to ride in and drive around and adventure in. It's, 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 it's going to be a good, good truck. It is still expensive. I mean, yeah. you know, Land Rovers are expensive. This is the right price point for what it is. I, I want more cars like this in the lower end of the market as well, but like, I am I am very bullish on Rivian. The more I've seen about these cars or trucks, yeah. Imagine more properly. Imagine four or five years from now, we've had we've had all the um, R1Ss in the world, and they've had they've had a chance to actually get into customers' hands, and people are enjoying using them. And five years from now, they build a smaller kind of crossover class because this is this is a big car, maybe not like a Chevy Tahoe, but closer to that than it is like a a smaller like Honda CRV or a Model Y equivalent. But maybe in five years they have that for forty five thousand or forty thousand, and and that'll be wildly popular because this is probably still too much money for a lot of people. But but if you're in the market and you have that kind of money, this is there are there's no other real option. The Model X, I think, is probably too small for some people at least and uh um yeah it's, it's just a beautiful car i like that yeah, first is. color too the launch edition color that green I think yeah that's something that i'm pretty tempted to yeah to pick up we have yeah, to, i've heard of i've heard, I've heard of quite a, quite a few people canceling their cybertruck orders and moving to rivian it's like i don't blame them it's 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 a beautiful beautiful truck it really is the truck or the suv maybe both 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 yeah. So I really hope Rivian does well because they're one of those companies that they're probably number two to my mind after Tesla in terms of like the most ready for market and like the furthest along. So we really should be cheering them on because if, if they do well, I think there's the further investment in other startups and new approaches and stuff will be all that much better. Yep. All right. And then that kind of brings us into... <laughs> This one I think bugs you more than it bugs me. Um, is the <laughs> the it GMC does. Hummer EV? Oh boy! What, what is what is so offensive about how they did that, Matt? Tell, tell us what. 
What bugs you about it? <laughs> As we all know at this point, this the Hummer EV is more 3D special effects than an actual prototype because all the prototypes that were shown in the you know YouTubers that got tours of it were not functioning prototypes. They were basically just dummy models. Um, my big issue with it is that no other car company does it this way. It's they 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 create these dummy models that are put into showrooms, but when they well, to be fair, Nikola, Nikola does it, and okay. they're doing great. So. <laughs> they're doing great. <laughs> they're partnered with GM. Um, so they're playing oh, so from the same what playbook. That's they got the idea from. Yeah, they're playing from the same playbook. So it's like, but every other car company, when they announce the car, they have a functioning prototype. So like when Ford unveiled the Mach-E, it was like they had a Mach-E that you could get in and drive around. It actually worked. Uh, it's like every car company does this. Tesla does it. Ford does it. BMW does it. VW does it. It's like the fact that they didn't and they rushed ahead. They tried to accelerate the timeline and bring something to the market to say, hey, me too, me too, me too, before they were actually ready. It makes me very dubious about what they say it's going to be able to do because they haven't actually built a working one yet. It's like if you've built a prototype, you can more confidently say, it's going to have this kind of range. It's going to have be able to do this because they know they can do it because they've already built a prototype. Or GM is kind of like, what kind of gotchas are they going to run into between now and when they actually do finish their prototype? It's like, how much is this going to change by the time it hits market because they announced it too early? It just, it's, it's, it's insane to me. It just, it gets me very riled up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's a good point. Even like the Cybertruck, whatever, a year and a half ago now. They mm -hmm. had people launching through the streets and, and, and having a chance to be inside of them. So, yeah, they had working ones even back then. Exactly. So I don't think it bugs me as much, and we talked about this a couple of days ago, but I don't have any doubt that GM can build an EV. I think they've built yeah. EVs before. They've built cars for 100 years. So I think they will figure it out. So for me, if you're a startup, like if you're Lucid or Rivian, you'd better got, you better have something that works because I'm trusting you to know how to build a car. But with GM... I think it can be forgiven, but I actually think the the bigger reason why, um, and I, let's I'm being op, I'm being optimistic. Let's hope the reason why is because <laughs> they are finalizing their Ultium technology stack, like yeah. their motors and batteries. So unlike Rivian, actually Rivian's got a kind of a platform standardized approach as well. Um, I know Volkswagen has their own kind of platform. That's kind of the right way to think about EVs. They should be kind of modular and plug and play because you don't have to have it individual engine for every car like you do for gas engine cars. You can easily dial in performance uh, kind of as a based on what you need. But I'm hoping that GM is in the final process of having their motors and inverters and the gearboxes, batteries all kind of flushed out because it doesn't, doesn't really make sense to go use random LG batteries or some other off-the-shelf stuff that they've done in the past for the Bolt just in the interest of getting to a prototype. I think what they're trying to do is let's get everything fully figured out, and then we'll build a car um, in accordance with that. So the Ultium tech isn't really in any cars yet, right? I think the right. Cadillac Lyric, the GMC Hummer EV, these are the kinds of future projects that they'll go into. And I'm hoping that they're investing in manufacturing plants and things to get the batteries and all that stuff uh, sorted out. But let's hope that's the reason why and not because they're, they're learning from Nikola, which is... Um, Concerning. It's probably unlikely, but <laughs> definitely concerning. Uh, <laughs> and um, and hope to have something soon. But I mentioned about the marketing. GM, General Motors is still very much like a dinosaur of a company. I think they've got a lot to figure out. Um, I actually like LeBron James a lot as an NBA player. But I have zero interest in hearing LeBron James' opinion about an electric SUV. He knows nothing about any of it. This is kind of the old-fashioned way, you know, having Roger Federer talk about shaving shavers like wh what is what does one thing have to do with the other here's a famous person who's talking about this for some reason i think that's not a good way to do marketing anymore and i think uh what rivian has done is way better and i think that's what people in the future should do so hopefully these legacy companies get that memo that you shouldn't just make goofy commercials and advertise like, i think young people especially like the the latest generation the millennials it doesn't work on them i think they'd much rather watch someone that they respect, drive it and, and or put it to its paces in, in some unique way like they did it with this show, which I'm going to bookmark that and watch it after this, by the way. Sounds it's, cool. It's a, it's a much more authentic way of marketing 
because it's actually showing the thing getting used and people actually reacting to it. It's what us and YouTube do. It's like it's authentic talking about different products and our opinions on it versus this very highly produced slick clearly has a very manufactured and manicured presentation. It's like that's the old way of doing it. And we were just talking about Tesla tequila. It's like the way that Rivian and Tesla are marketing themselves is radically different from old school car companies like GM. And it's and I do agree with you. I am optimistic that they will they will make this. I have no doubt they're going to make it. I don't think they're going to make it on the timeline they promised. There's no way they're delivering this on time. Come on. It's like there's not even a working prototype and they're saying it's basically going to be next year, wasn't it? 2021? Yeah, but they do have manufacturing in hand. Like they could spin down a plant somewhere in Ohio and say, look, switch over and start building this thing. We've got it pretty much in hand. That's where like Lucid and Rivian and Tesla, they're building factories to start being able to do this. GM has, I don't even know the number, 100 factories ready to go um, in different continents even if, if it makes sense for them to do it somewhere else. So potentially they could hit that number if they can get the battery supply right. And if they don't, I think what would happen is they would just kind of limp along and have very low volume but technically be in production and have these cars start to ship until the Ultium batteries can get scaled up to a point where they can actually support any meaningful kind of level of volume. I think I think what you just described is what will happen. If they have anything out December 31st, 2021, they deliver their first Hummer. It's going to be hand built. It's going to be like they'll be shipping like 100 of them a month. It's going to be very low volume, but they may technically hit their deadline, but it's going to be very very low volume. I don't see them hitting a volume production on this thing by the end of next year. Do we know when the Cybertruck will be ready? Okay. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a feeling it's going to be ahead of schedule. Just because of like what they did with the Y. The Y being ahead of schedule, I think they're going to yeah. they're, I think they're going to pull the same trick out of the hat for the Cybertruck as well. Let's hope. Let's hope because I want to get mine as soon as possible. But for the Y, they already had a lot of the factory space kind of in in hand for the from the 3. They're building a new factory for the Cybertruck. So, I think that's yeah. the the concern or the risk but yeah they'll, they'll i'm sure they'll figure it out yeah so that was i think what we had on our list of of topics right yeah that was that was the topics for this week so this is um this is why we're doing this matt and i are friends and we talk about this stuff on the side and we both realized it is really hard to make these videos on our channels because of the level of work we do and rather than change our format there what if we just got together and talked about cool stuff like this on the side and that's just one other place for you guys to watch us or to hear what crazy ideas that we have yeah. all the while keeping our main channels kind of focused the way they are currently. And um, I'm, I'm glad we started doing this. We've been talking about this for about six weeks and we finally recorded an episode. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> After we, about an hour and a half today we just one. alone. Trying to... <laughs> yeah. After many technical difficulties getting this up and running, we did it. So and, I'm proud and of us. And by the way... <laughs> yeah, so Matt, the next goal now, we need to go reach out to our subscribers and let them know and broadcast this and make sure they watch this and get their comments and their feedback and, and kind of improve on it. But I'm yep. hoping, maybe not next week, maybe not the week after that, but this should be a weekly show, right? We can agree on yep. that. Yep. And I'm hoping maybe in two or three weeks we can do this live. Is yes. that crazy? I, I, w I would love to do this live and be able to take like real-time comments, like a little Q&A at the end or something like that. It should be a lot of fun. Exactly, yeah, maybe we do... Yeah. The first half is our topics, and we just leave it kind of open because our viewers will have all kinds of cool news that yeah. we haven't even heard of. You can guarantee. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Fantastic. Well, this was a lot of fun. It was a inaugural episode. <laughs> a lot of rough edges, but we'll get better at this as we go. Absolutely. Yes. Vice versa. Episode one. Thank you so much <laughs> for watching, and thank you, Matt. Uh, this should be this should be fun. Yeah. Thank you, Ricky, and we'll see you guys in the next one. <laughs>